Welcome to the table. Good morning. We're glad you're here today to worship. Let's stand together as we join in worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords.
prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are today, both the Lion of Judah and the Lamb who was slain for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you today, Lord. You alone are worthy of our worship and praise, and so we lift you up today in the name of Jesus. Amen. without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Let's sing the second verse, Ashes Ash was redeemed only beauty
to celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection today. I'm going to ask Joseph, if he will, just to come and lead us in our time of communion today. And you may be seated at this time. My name is Joseph Bayo, and I thank God and I thank our Pastor for allowing me to um, officiate for this morning's communion service. As we all see, communion is one of the Christian um, sacrament practices that we all believe in. In the Old Testament, the Passover lamb was sacrificed. In the New Testament, Jesus instituted the communion so that humanity can know his love, his suffering, and then his second coming. According to First Peter, uh, First Corinthians, sorry, chapter eleven, the Apostle Paul said, "I received from the Lord what I give unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that He was betrayed, He took the bread." And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as you take this cup, you drink from this cup. So this morning, as we see, we are about to take the communion, the bread symbolizes the body of Christ that was shed on Calvary for the redemption of mankind. And the, the, the blood, which now we see as Jews, also symbolizes the blood of Jesus that was also shed for our sins. Shall we humbly um, close our eyes for a short prayer? Lord, we thank you this morning. We bless you, God, for the love you have bestowed upon us. We appreciate so much, Lord. We are most grateful unto you. As your church, God is prepared to Take this morning's communion. I pray, dear Lord, that you prepare our hearts, that you bless us, God, that God, you even heal us, us from our, our infirmities, 
from our sicknesses. That Lord, you also give us the joy that we need to worship you, to follow you, and to live in this world. I bless you, God. In your name I pray. Amen. So, um, we have one table over here, and then we also have another table over there on my left side. And um, I think the one at the back is for those is gluten-free. So, those who would like that one too can please take from there. So, we may start here, there, up there. Thank you.
Let's just bow together. And Lord, we are grateful today that through your blood, through your death, it can be well with our soul. We can be in a right relationship with you. And for that today, we are grateful. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And God bless you. You may be seated. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to our service today. How's everyone doing today? Do we have any mo mothers, moms here today? Can everybody stand if you're a mother? So we can just tell you how thankful we are for all of you. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to you. Hopefully I'm not the first one to tell you that, but we're glad that you're here with us today. Um, I want to invite Jeff to come forward. Each week he passes out a black booklet that you sign and you pass down your aisle. And while he does that, um, let's pray for our offering this morning. Dear Jesus, we thank you for everything that you do, the way that you provide constantly. And we continue to give you all the praise and glory. We ask that you just bless our tithes and offerings today in your name. Amen. As you can see, we're still doing um, our cards and we're trying to raise $45,000 here at the church. And if you see today, we're up to 30000 I want to let you know that it's not too late because I'm just now today turning in my card. So, so it's um, not too late to give. If you got a bulletin today, you can fill out something in the bulletin also. But we're getting very close to that. So if you want to be involved in that, that would be great. I want to remind you that you can always give online here at the church. So when we encourage that. If you, that's the way you like to give, um, it's easy to do it that way. Also, if you would like to be involved in one of our our prayer groups during the week. I always invite you to come and be part of corporate prayer here to church um, from 7 to 8 o'clock on Tuesdays or Wednesdays at 6 o'clock with us. So you're invited always for that. If you know someone who's home for the summer for a college and career, there's a Sunday school class during this service that you can go and hang out over here um, in the Leap of Faith Dance Studios that Greg Sharp is teaching. Um, he's doing an excellent job. Um, be able to invite people to come to that. And I want to uh, tell you about our SummerSlam. Our, um, in my uh, life, it's Vacation Bible School, but it's going to be three days during the summer where the kids are going to come and they're going to have a great time together. And Mickey's prepared lots of great things for those few days together. So um, just pass the word, bring your children, um, volunteer, be part of that. And that's coming really soon. As always, you can find out any information here at the church through our social media. Thanks. There's a real emphasis in our school systems, or public school systems right now, to uh, curb and to stop bullying. And um, I want to share with you a true story about a bully who no one trusted. In fact, many people thought he was dangerous. He had a reputation, the kind of reputation that church people, that good people, did not want to be around him. And yes, his example goes along perfectly with our sermon series that we're doing uh, called The Untouchable. He was what we might label an untouchable person. And we know that Jesus loves him because Jesus loves everybody, but it's hard for us to believe that God would have a plan for this guy's life. But a person in the local church was sensing that God was speaking to them about reaching out to this bully. And very reluctantly, he, he reached out and he touched this dangerous outcast. And that was the beginning of a huge change in the life of this bully. Because he began to follow Jesus. He began to tell other people about Jesus. And this is a true story. Last week we heard a true story about a lady named Shirley from the inner city of, of Kansas City. She came to know Jesus. And today's example could also be a modern day story, but it isn't. It's a story from the early church. The dangerous bully was none other than a man named Saul. And the man that touched him was named Ananias. 
Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. And look what he did. He placed his hands on Saul. And he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course, we now know that Saul became the Apostle Paul and wrote much of our New Testament. And Paul is a great example of someone who the church labeled untouchable. The culture, the society, they didn't label Paul untouchable. It was the church that did that. And you can't really blame the church for for labeling Paul as untouchable because Paul was a little rough on the church. In fact, he was trying to kill them. And so we can't be too harsh on the church. But even after Saul's conversion, even after Ananias went to him and he was filled with the Holy Spirit, the church still treated him like an untouchable. They wanted him to stay at arm's length until somebody stepped up, somebody stepped out on faith and followed the lead of Jesus. And this time it was a man named Barnabas. So when he, Paul, came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Remember, he had been trying to kill them. So not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. You see, Barnabas himself was an apostle of Jesus. You and I are apostles of Jesus today. Barnabas wasn't one of the 12 disciples He became a follower of Jesus later, just like we did. And I have a feeling that, like many Jesus followers, Barnabas learned how to love untouchables from hearing the stories of Jesus. So we're going to look at a story. We're going to hear a story of Jesus today also. And perhaps like Barnabas, it's going to challenge us to reach out to someone, maybe even someone in the church, that we may have always considered to be untouchable. This story of Jesus that we're looking at today was told by the gospel writer Luke. And using modern day language, we could title the story this way, that Jesus meets one of the bad girls of the Bible. There were many bad girls in the Bible. Jesus met one of them in this story today. And if we could say something about the leper that had a skin disease from last week, we could certainly say it about this lady. Does anybody remember the first point that I shared last week about the leper, the untouchable, who had skin disease. Anybody at all remember what I said about him? I said he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. And if we could say that about him, we could certainly say it about this bad girl. Because here's the setting. Jesus was one of several guests that's having dinner with this religious leader. And during the dinner, this bad girl, most likely a prostitute, shows up at the dinner. Why did she show up? She came to see Jesus. That was clear. And I want to say this as directly as I can today, that in this culture and in this setting, we confidently know this one thing about the bad girl. It's that she was the wrong person, she was in the wrong place, and it was the wrong time for her to be there. And what she did to Jesus is nothing less than scandalous. You see, the people at that time, they ate very differently than we in the modern West eat today. We pull up our seat, we sit at the table, and we eat. In the ancient Middle East, eating was not so task-oriented as it is today. And by that I mean we sit down to eat and we, we need to hurry many times. That's, that's where we, we coined the term fast food. Eating is a necessary evil, and so we usually sit down and grab a bite to eat and we're on our way, very task-oriented. Not so in the ancient Middle East. They were not in a hurry, and eating was connected very much to fellowship and time together. So what they did was they lounged around on cushions. It's like when we recline in our recliner and we're watching TV and we have a bag of chips. Maybe I'm the only one that does that. I don't know. They were reclining at the table. Now, 
for me, I could not lay down and eat. I have acid reflux, maybe some of you do too, and that's a no-no to be laying down and eating. But that's what they did. That's how they did it in the ancient Middle East. They probably didn't eat as much fast food. They probably didn't eat their food as fast as we do. So they didn't probably have problems with acid reflux back then. But when we think of a dining room table, here's what we usually look at, what we think of. Dining room table and a dining room, a formal dining room at that. But to understand our scripture today, we need to think of something a little different than that. We need to think of a, a table more like this one, low to the ground with some cushions around it. I don't think that Jesus was probably in a modern uh, home like that, um, but lower table, think lower table for today's story. And why does any of this matter? Here's why, because one of the Pharisees, one of the religious leaders, invited Jesus to have dinner with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house, and Luke makes this very clear, he reclined at the table. People understood exactly what that meant. Jesus was reclining at the table, and that's super important to this story. It's super important for us to understand that cultural event that took place because we have to picture Jesus in a different way than how we would picture him sitting and eating at a table with us. Jesus was most likely leaning on his elbow, probably laying on his side with his, his legs extended. And the sinful woman came up and approached Jesus at his feet. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. We've heard this story many times. In fact, it was only just a several, several weeks ago during the season of Lent that I spoke on this exact passage. But I'm not sure we really comprehend the inappropriateness of what was taking place here. There are many theories, and I've read and studied a lot about what was happening here culturally. And even recently, I heard a message about the sexual inappropriateness of what had happened here. That made me want to study this even more. And some people believe that in the ancient Middle East, if a female approached a male at his feet in this manner, it was something very sexual. In fact, many scholars agree that feet were sometimes a euphemism for private parts. And other times, a lady would approach a man at his feet to inquire whether that man would marry her. You think about the story in the Old Testament of Ruth and Boaz. And if you read that story, you see that Ruth approached Boaz at night at his feet and uncovered his feet. The fact that this sinful woman had her hair hanging down instead of up. And she was able to wipe Jesus' feet with her hair extended. That's also considered sexual in nature many times in the Middle Eastern culture. And it would make sense in this story, it would, it would fit the context for this lady of the evening, this prostitute, to have been acting in an erotic and sexual way. And while that might not have been her motive at all, she may have been perceived as being very sexually inappropriate. And at the very least... She probably could have been perceived as being ashamed and not wanting to show her face to Jesus. But any way you look at this, the sinful lady was in the wrong place, wrong time, acting and behaving inappropriately. And we can come to this conclusion by what Luke tells us in the story. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, He said to himself, if this man, speaking about Jesus, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now, if I had to use a modern-day illustration to really help us understand this, here's what I would say. I compare this woman's behavior, this woman's activity, to a a lady coming into our service this morning or coming into one of our Sunday school classes or maybe a small group during the week, and then when she comes in and sits down, she proceeds to take off off her top, exposing her breasts. 
That's how inappropriate this was. So what would we do in that situation? What should the Sunday school teacher say? Um, Excuse me, ma'am, would you please put your clothes back on? We're trying to focus on the scripture. What would the pastor say? Now, would I call security? Hey, can somebody get security in here? Can somebody call the police and take this woman out of here? She's distracting us. What would we say? Because you see, it was up to Jesus to stop this inappropriate behavior. He was the one with whom she was interacting. He was the expert. He was the teacher of the law. As the Pharisee said, if he's a prophet like he's supposed to be, he would know. And Jesus could have done a number of things while his legs were extended. He could have pulled his knees up towards his chest and moved away from this lady. He could have said, hey, stop. But you know what? He didn't. This bad girl already carried enough shame. She already was pronounced guilty by all those that were there at the dinner table. And so Jesus didn't do anything. He didn't say anything to her. He didn't tell her to stop. He didn't pull himself away from her as if she was dirty and unclean. He didn't even say, ma'am, you're acting inappropriately. Please stop. Now, wait a minute. I do want to tell you this, that a little later in the story, Jesus did say something to her. It it didn't bring more shame and guilt on her. In fact, it brought freedom, the kind of freedom that we sing about today. It brought abundance to her life. It brought meaning and purpose, just like last week with the man with the skin disease. You know what Jesus said as he loved this untouchable lady? Luke tells us. Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And here's the irony in this story. We may never consider ourselves to be an untouchable. We might sit here week after week and listen to this, listen to these messages about untouchable people, and we might think, oh man, I'm glad that I'm not like that. I don't fit into these horrible categories. I'm not a, a person with the skin disease. I'm not a lady that's a prostitute. I'm not this, I'm not that. But Jesus says the exact same thing to us today. Your sins are forgiven. And maybe we're here today and we do think, man, I am untouchable. I am an untouchable person. Remember what I said last week, that in Jesus' eyes, everyone is untouchable. I mean, everyone is touchable. No one is untouchable in Jesus' eyes. And to all of us, he says the same thing. He says, your sins are forgiven. We have a Uh, ministry here at our church where some of our ladies are involved in reaching people who are considered untouchable ladies human trafficking is a bit of a hot topic right now many of us have seen the movie taken and it's one of our favorite movies Mm -hmm. um but it portrays human trafficking um from this innocent woman's standpoint where she was taken um, and kidnapped and sold into an international sex ring Um, and it's natural for us after we see that movie to want to go and save all the girls and I know that was um, our response and literally just wanted to like go across the world and save the girls Um, so it's natural for us to want to just do that and have that response. But what about the girls that we see on the street corner? What about those girls that when we're driving downtown, we see them singing there? Um, What about them? Are they the same women underneath all of that that we see in the movie Taken? Mm -hmm. I work, Brandy and Jamie, we're two of the three founders of Out of Darkness Columbus, and we work with women who've been sex trafficked. Um, We really like, though, to extend the table a little bit longer and include anyone who's been commercially sexually exploited, and I know that's a really big word. What that really means is anybody who's been involved in the making of pornography or dancing at strip clubs or being sold online um, through an escort service, or the women that walk on the streets. The list really goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Um, The thing about people who are involved in prostitution is the vast, vast majority of them are actually under the control of someone, um, someone we call a trafficker or a pimp. And they prey upon these women's deepest vulnerabilities um, for their own personal gain. And it's natural to want to help women in that situation. Um, But what about the ones who choose it? 
Um, let me just say this, there are very few, very few who actually choose it and it is the choice of one who has no other choices. Um, so what about those women? Um, so we really feel very strongly that God has called us and other people. We have a wonderful third partner um, who's created, started this ministry and then we have wonderful volunteers, but he has called us specifically to go to these women and to tell them that they are beautiful and they are worthy and they are worthy of his love and that he died that they may have life abundant. Um, so let me just say again, he's called us to that, but we really firmly believe he has called us, the body of Christ, to go to people who nobody else wants to go to and tell them, again, that he died, that they may have life abundant. They don't need to carry their shame and their guilt any longer. Yeah, so we have two of our three ministries. We work with the women right on the street. So the first one is called Princess Night. It's our street outreach. We go to Parsons and Livingston Avenue every Friday night and hand out roses and handwritten cards to the ladies and just really meet them right where they're at. And then we also have a drop-in house right off of Parsons Avenue where the ladies can come on, come in on Fridays and have a meal with us. We do an activity with them. I mean, really just build relationship and see them where they're at and love them right where they're at. And they carry so much shame when they come in. Um, I think we all carry shame and but the shame that these women ca carry is something I've never seen before and it's so hard to break through and so we just are there to love them and like Jamie said just let them know you are worth it and we love you no matter what you've done in your life we love you um, no matter what you continue to do or choose to do and we're gonna walk with you through this and we know that um, God has called us specifically to do that but really just to meet them where they're at and go to them where they're at we're starting to see God move in their lives, like their their minds transformed. We've had ladies who've said, you know, why couldn't I have overdosed? Because yeah. now I have to face my children and the shame that that comes with me not being strong enough to get mm -hmm. through this. Um, but then she turned around and we encouraged her and said, no, God has a plan for you. He loves you. You're worth it. And she turned around and said, you know what? I'm starting to believe that. I believe that he does. And so by just being able to be there consistently and show them hands That's and feet the love of Christ, um, they're starting to believe it. So um, we have a third part of our ministry that we're getting ready to open. We've been working on an emergency safe house, and we're just a little little bit out from getting that open. And um, what will happen with that is when these women get the courage to, to leave the life, they'll make a phone call. Um, we'll send a team to go pick her up, and we'll take her to a house where we will get to show her unconditional love, get to give her rest, and get to show her to be what it's like to be part of a family and tell her about the love of Christ. And then we're gonna walk with her through to the next steps of recovery for her so she can get her life back and have that abundant life. So if you feel moved by human trafficking or through this series, um, we know God broke our hearts for this specific issue. And so if that is you, if you're sitting out there today, um, and God is just doing something in your heart, we just encourage you to come talk to us after the service. We would love to talk with you. Um, there's many ways to get involved with us. You can come on Princess Night, our street outreach. You can work in the drop-in center. If you're one of those people who are like, you know, I, I, I could not go down to Parsons Avenue. Um, that's totally fine. There's many things behind the scenes that, that you can be a part of um, and really changing these women's lives. So we would love to talk with you. We would love to connect with you. Um, and we really just, as the body of Christ, just want to see us really just go and break down those barriers and see the women for who they really are mm -hmm. um just not that that mask that they put up up front so thank you thank you <clears throat> it's exciting that we are able to partner with with out of darkness here in this church um i actually went with them on one of the princess nights on a friday evening there was a there were about 10 of us uh in a in a van um, it's not marked as a church van it's just, it was it is our church van but it doesn't have the name of the church if it did that might it might uh, scare some of the ladies away but I asked the girls I said what is my job you know what am I supposed to do and they said well you just you know when we open the doors to to, to meet these ladies and to give them a rose and to talk to them you just stand by the door of the van and and hold the doors open and I said so you're putting me a 50-some-year-old fat guy out here to do <laughs> to do bodyguard stuff. And they said, oh, no, no, it's not really bodyguard. You just kind of watch and make sure and that kind of thing. So we went out and we approached the family. And uh, it was actually a, a, a mother and a younger teenage girl and several children. And they gave them some roses. They gave them some snacks and some water and just prayed with them. And then we moved on a little farther. And there was another lady. And I thought, these these aren't prostitutes. These aren't people who are being trafficked inhumanely. 
these are just people that are walking around. I thought, there's not really any prostitutes down here. But as we traveled and as it got a little bit later, I began to see these ladies coming out in the corners. This was right down in Columbus, too, coming out under the corners. Some of them, when we would open the, the van doors, they would run away from us. They would turn and run because maybe their pimp was nearby or something. So this is reality. And these girls are actually doing exactly what Christ was doing in that situation with this sinful woman. He, he was reaching an untouchable person. And uh, that might not be the category uh, of people that you consider untouchable that you're able to reach out to. But as these weeks go on, you will find more and more individuals, even like the Apostle Paul who was in the church who had been converted and he was still an untouchable. You may find somebody within our own church who's considered to be an untouchable. And we just want to challenge all of us today, myself included, to reach out to these individuals, to reach out and love them. There's other things you can do for out of darkness. They need a tremendous amount of support in a lot of different ways. Uh, I, I love garage sales, so I helped them this week on Thursday and Friday with their garage sale. They made $3,600 at their garage sale towards their, um, their, their ministry and what they're trying to accomplish, which was great. Um, but they have a, a safe house that they are working on, and some of you have been a part of helping with that. There's certainly, they, they desperately need prayer every time they go out. Some of this stuff is a little bit dangerous and that type of thing. They need prayer warriors. They need givers. They need helpers. And uh, if, this is, if this is something that, that touches your heart, I just want to challenge you to, to live off of what the scriptures say and begin to touch the untouchable. If this particular area is not an area that, uh, uh, in which you find interest or you don't think you're able to do this for whatever reason, be aware in the weeks ahead as we look at people who are untouchable. Next week we'll be talking about addictions. And we know that there are addictions within our own church. Sometimes addicted people are untouchable. But we're going to talk about that next week and talk about what Jesus did with those who were addicted and the, those who were overcome with evil. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we close today. Father, may your word again influence the way we live our lives as we follow you. And just like Barnabas, Lord, may we, may we see your stories and hear your stories and may we reach those who appear or seem to be untouchable. In Jesus' name we pray. And God bless you, you are dismissed.